The year was 1736. George II sat on the throne, although Parliament had seized control of the legislative agenda since the Revolutionary Settlement Acts of the late 17th and early 18th century. It was now the dominant political force in the land. Sir Robert Walpole was the Whig Prime Minister of Great Britain, the first man to hold the office since the constitutional upheaval. The balance of power had inexorably shifted. Hundreds of miles away from Westminster, and far from the political struggles of the day, James Watt was born in the lowlands of Scotland. His parents were respected members of the community from distinguished and well-educated families. They would have had high expectations for their son. What they could not have imagined is that his name would become synonymous with power, not political this time, but steam. James Watt would become one of the giants of the Industrial Revolution, and his inventions would redefine the British economy and infrastructure. His legacy would reach down through the centuries that followed, far exceeding the fame he enjoyed during his life. But how did this come about? What did James Watt do to write himself into history? James Watt was born on the 19th of January, 1736, in the Scottish town of Greenock. His parents were strong Presbyterians, raised in the Covenanter movement. James's father, also a James Watt, worked in both the shipping industry and local government, whilst his grandfather was a teacher of mathematics, surveying and navigation. During his early years, James was often unwell, and his mother educated him at home for some years until he was strong enough to attend the local grammar school. He was a bright child, exhibiting an aptitude for mathematics which would serve him well in later life. After leaving school, Watt worked in the workshops of his father's businesses, demonstrating considerable dexterity and skill in creating engineering models. When he was 18, his mother died, and his father's health began to fail, forcing Watt to look for training elsewhere. What seems to have been very important for him was his Calvinist religious background, an emphasis upon truth and hard work and avoiding waste and accounting yourself before God. What also absorbed more scientific and what we might call enlightenment forms of thinking, when he spent time at the University of Glasgow, he was never a student there, but after he'd spent some time in London advancing his scientific instrument training, he came back to Scotland and worked at Glasgow University as an instrument maker repairing a lot of their small machines. The academics there were extremely impressed by his skills and willingness to learn and knowledge. So he absorbed a lot of the principles of heat and understanding of gases, and also about the importance of applying scientific knowledge to the real world. What had developed his scientific understanding of steam at Glasgow University, where he repaired one of the model Newcomen engines there, now, Newcomen engines, even in model form, were appallingly inefficient. The big ones were inefficient. The little models, by the time you got down to one that was about a metre high, that was the limit. If you reduce it any further, it wouldn't run at all. And he was asked to look at this engine, which was just less than a metre high. It wouldn't run. They'd even sent it down to London, to a famous instrument maker in London. Uh, and he'd failed. So what looked at it, and by very carefully, checking it, cleaning it, making sure that all the pipes were clear and so on. He managed to get it so it would run, purely for demonstration. It produced no power, but it was at least then able to do what it was supposed to do, which was to demonstrate the movement of an engine to the students. But he, like all the rest, thought this is no good. But he was the one who thought, I'm going to make a better job of sorting it out. Watt carried on working as an instrument maker for another year, but the power of steam and its potential applications were now firmly lodged in his mind. After cogitating upon the subject for a year or two, suddenly he thought, why don't we separate the cold bit of the engine, the condensing, from the hot bit, the steam? And so he had two vessels, a steam cylinder connected to a cold condenser, connected by a valve which could be operated by the engine beam. And that was a great breakthrough. He built a model. 
it worked. And very rapidly, he could see that he would get twice the power, and he was getting an awful lot better efficiency. Despite this potentially workable design, there were still substantial difficulties in constructing a full-scale engine. This required more capital, which was hard to find. Eventually, financial backing came from John Roebuck, the founder of the celebrated Karen Ironworks near Falkirk, with whom Watt formed a working partnership. Roebuck lived at Keneal House in Bowness, during which time Watt worked at perfecting his steam engine in a cottage close to the house. Roebuck spent a great deal of money on Watt's invention, but fell into bankruptcy before it became commercially viable. Strapped for resources, Watt was forced to take up employment, first as a surveyor, then as a civil engineer, for eight years while he tried to perfect his design. The Newcomen engine could put up with a pretty rough cylinder, the Watt engine couldn't. And while Watt had made cylinders for his models, making a full-size engine was quite beyond them. And so he wasn't really getting much further. He tried all sorts of other ways of getting a smooth cylinder, even making one by rolling sheet metal failed. But in the meantime, what he could do from all the information he got was get a patent. And to get the patent, he would travel up and down between Glasgow and London. During his travels at this time, James Watt visited Birmingham for some supplies on what was intended to be a routine stop. However, having never been there before, he was left astonished at the opportunities that were on offer. So Birmingham is a small uh, market town. It's got no great natural advantages. It hasn't got a river, it's not near the sea. It's an unconstituted town. It, it has no guilds, it has no controls, really. So it's very welcoming to uh, non-conformists and basically non-Anglicans. So anyone can make a living in Birmingham, and that's what makes it quite unusual. During his visit, Watt was introduced to the Lunar Society of Birmingham, a dinner club and informal society of prominent learned figures in the area. So the Lunar Society were a group of men. The society is, is completely disorganised and there's no, there's no formal agenda, there's no formal minutes. It's a group of friends, basically, with the common interests, and the common interest is, is what we would now call science, but what they call natural philosophy. And it was about studying empirically, recording your notes, and correspondence, you know, they corresponded widely. So they, they met by the light of the full moon, and that enabled them to find their way home more easily. And I suppose there's a degree of truth. I live in the middle of nowhere. And when there's a full moon, you know, you can see much better. <laughs> However, the membership was oh, a range of people. It was, it was the sort of founders, if you like, were Matthew Bolton, um, who became Watt's business partner. There was Erasmus Darwin, one of um, Charles Darwin's grandfathers. Despite not yet living in Birmingham, Watt continued an extensive correspondence with the Lunar Society, and became a central figure in their discussions. Watt's financial difficulties continued and his personal struggles were exacerbated by the tragic death of his first wife, Margaret Miller, during childbirth. Upon hearing this, key members of the Lunar Society wrote to Watt, urging him to move to Birmingham. One man, Matthew Bolton, was particularly keen with the transition. Bolton's a very attractive character, actually. He's very engaging. He's, he's got the gift of the gab. He's, he's someone who forever on the verge of bankruptcy because he's, he's an entrepreneur, so he takes risks. He builds this massive, you know, one of the first factories in the country, and it costs, you know, far more than ever intended, and there's no way that that business could kind of sustain it, and so that's when he sort of casts around to look for something that will be more profitable. And, you know, he sees in, in, in what's an unrealised invention that there's huge potential, not, not just to help him produce his existing goods, but to, to produce the engine itself, I think. Through Bolton, Watt finally had access to some of the best iron workers in the world, who were able to assist with many of the technical problems that he had been facing. Watt and Bolton formed a hugely successful company called Bolton and Watt, which would last for the next 25 years. They were just uh, the odd couple, you know, they were, they, were, they were chalk and cheese, they were completely different personalities. You know, you've got Bolton who was an extrovert, always got the eye on the main chance, and then you've got Watt who's the extreme opposite, you know, he is cautious, he is a worrier, never wants to, uh, to do anything till he's absolutely sure. And so he's sort of hurried along by Bolton, which of course is, is exactly what he needs. Using Bolton's resources, Watt's steam engine was finally fully realised and commercially viable. The next step for the budding partnership was to begin the hunt for customers. The one advantage that what steam engine had was that it was much more efficient. Now that didn't matter if the engine was to pump water 
out of coal mines because there was plenty of coal there. And the Newcomen engine could be repaired by a blacksmith and carpenter. The Watt steam engine couldn't. However, in Cornwall, the advantage of the Watt steam engine proved its effectiveness because Cornwall doesn't have any coal. So coal had to be imported long distances, which added to its expanse. The Watt steam engine could reduce that demand for coal. And therefore, the first regional takeoff of the Bolton and Watt steam engine, we can say, was in Cornwall. Watt also was very effective at preventing other potential steam engine innovators from muscling in on his designs. So what was always operating within a commercial and competitive environment. The success of the business meant that Watt had to explain to customers the benefits of his engine, particularly the amount of power that they could generate. To do this, he coined the term horsepower, which has lasted to this day. When people asked him, well, how powerful is this machine could be? He said, well, it would replace X numbers of horses. The term has been given more accurate measurements, of course, but that term still supplies today. This um, quantifying of power with horsepower, I mean, it's, it's quite, uh, you know, he coins that expression, which is really kind of, well, it's brilliant, but it's also very catchy. You know, it's, you know, you, you can it visualize, it helps you visualize power. During this time, Watt married his second wife, Anne McGregor, with whom he would remain for the rest of his life. However, the illnesses that plagued him since he was a small child never fully left him, and he continued to suffer with headaches and depression throughout his adult life. Despite these demons, with no small thanks to his support network, James Watt was able to continue making massive technological advancements with the steam engine, honing and refining his earlier work. Watt developed another dimension to the steam engine, the rotary motion, which enabled the up and down pumping engine to be transferred to uh, a rotary motion, which could be used to power machinery. And that enabled the Watt steam engine eventually to be used in factories to drive machinery. By the 1990s, the steam engine was becoming a successful commercial proposition and Bolton and Watt became wealthy. They were able in 1996 to, contract, to construct a distinct steam engine foundry at Smethwick. The Soho foundry was particularly a location for manufacturing steam engines alone. They were manufactured in parts and the foundry was very close to a major canal network. So that helped to keep prices low, sort of concentrating production. Steam was something that captured people's imagination and increasingly entered different aspects of life. And what certainly can be seen as one of the individuals who contributed to the mature industrial revolution that was heavily dependent upon steam technology. Watt's work with Bolton was strengthened by the team that he had around him in particular through his relationship with the firm's lead engineer and fellow inventor William Murdoch, who he worked alongside for many years. William Murdoch, like James Watt, was a Scot, and so the story goes, Murdoch walked all the way down from Ayrshire and, and knocked on Matthew Bolton's door and asked him to give him a job. Well, to what extent that's true is, is difficult to say, but certainly very soon, both Bolton and Watt acquired a lot of respect for Murdoch's ability. He was a quick learner. He was somebody who was able to translate Watt's scientific ideas and knowledge into reality. Murdoch's very useful. He's, he's a great innovator himself. He's never given any credit for anything, uh, at least until 1800, because the patents are all in Watt's name. So anything that Murdoch invents improves as an employee is patented by Watt. He invents a steam carriage which can run on the roads. Watt didn't believe that that type of invention was physically possible. 
that it wouldn't be able to move its own weight through its own power, let alone pull wagons or carriages. So there wasn't always complete agreement, but both Bolton and Watt had respect for Murdoch, and Murdoch deserves his own place in the history of the Industrial Revolution and the history of adventure. Watt retired in 1800, the same year that his fundamental patent and partnership with Bolton expired. He continued to work as an inventor during his retirement, maintaining his interest in civil engineering, and was a consultant on several significant projects, including a water pump under the River Clyde in Glasgow. His famous partnership with Bolton was transferred to the men's sons, Matthew Robinson Bolton and James Watt Jr. William Murdoch was soon made a partner, and the firm continued to prosper. He did lay down instructions for his death that he wasn't to have an elaborate funeral or, or an elaborate monument. Now that might reflect a degree of modesty, but James Watt Jr. ignored those requests and went, if you like, to an opposite extreme. Watt certainly had an ego, but I think he would have found it quite difficult to be the same subject of adulation as he seems to have become in popular culture, where he appears in adverts, he appears on trade cards, he's on medals, he's on commemorative plates. These are all part of a cult of what? But I suspect he would have not wanted to have got too greatly involved in that. James Watt died on the 25th of August 1819 at his home in Heathfield Hall near Handsworth at the age of 83. He was buried on the 2nd of September in the graveyard at St Mary's Church. After his death, thanks to the enduring success of his company, his son James Watt Jr. launched a huge campaign celebrating his father's life and work. Watt was an amazing character, you know, he was brilliant in so many ways, but the way that the Watt myth was created was by his son, James Watt Jr., who, who after a very rocky childhood with his father, they kind of come together, make up, <laughs> and, uh, and he becomes his kind of biggest fan, really. And then he, uh, even in Watt's lifetime, is promoting him. And then when he dies, he, he you know, goes into overdrive and, and just promotes his father. Biographies are commissioned, very favourable ones. Uh, statues are commissioned, paintings, and it's all um, down to Watt Jr. One very interesting aspect of James Watt is that we know a huge amount about him. The survival of the Watt papers have enabled historians for a long period of time to provide a detailed record of, of him. So same actually applies to Matthew Bolton. There are the records he left in his notebooks. There's domestic records and there are, of course, the vast business records, together with the correspondence that he received from outside and copies of the correspondence he would send out. For a lot, in a lot of archives, we don't have correspondence that people sent out in reply. In the case of Watt and Matthew Bolton, those do survive and they help in giving Watt the reputation that he has. James Watt's development of an efficient steam engine transformed industry and society. It helped Great Britain become the world's first industrialised society, which led to an unprecedented pace of economic growth and accelerated technological development across the world. The availability of efficient, reliable power made whole new classes of industry economically viable, and in doing so it brought about immense social change attracting millions of rural families to the towns and cities. His legacy as the father of the Industrial Revolution has been solidified in history, and public awareness of his life and work remains high to this day. Cutting through the legend to the man beneath may be a difficult task at times, but it cannot be doubted that James Watt played an enormous role in shaping the world we live in today.